By the end of 2016, more than 5,000 people had drowned crossing the Mediterranean Sea. While indeed a large number of them were fleeing conflict, an overwhelming number of them were fleeing for their lives of trying to survive in extreme poverty. By the end of 2016, more than a million people had tried to enter the U.S. illegally. And while indeed a large number of them were fleeing gang warfare in their barrios, an overwhelming number of them were fleeing for their lives of trying to survive on $2.50 a day, or what 50% of the world's population survives on. See, we've, we've been found out. Our, our wealth, our lifestyle, this fairy tale that we live in our land, we've been found out, and the world's coming for it, whether it's Sub-Saharan Africa or whether it's Latin America. I'm not here today to talk about an immigration man. I'm not here to talk about a bigger, better wall. I'm here to talk about capitalism because I believe that capitalism is the number one tool that we have to transform the world. See, I am a product of capitalism. The life that's been afforded to me is directly related to capitalism. Today, the way I spend my money, the way I live my life, the things I say, the, the things I do, are directly related to capitalism. I've been to socialist countries. I've been in social-run hospitals. I don't want anything to do with socialism. I've been to communist country. I've been in a communist jail. I, I don't want anything to do with communism. So I believe that capitalism is the number one tool that we have in the 21st century to transform the globe, both spiritually as well as physically. But likewise, I also believe if we take the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 10, 23, where he said, all things are permitted, but not all things are beneficial. If we'd apply those words to capitalism, I believe that the world we live in today would be a different place. So over the last decade, the numbers of people living in extreme poverty around the globe have been cut dramatically. During that same time span, there's been incredible advancements in technology and globalization. So today, now more than ever, those masses still living in poverty are aware more than ever of just exactly what they're missing out on living in the global south. Honduras, for example. Honduras has the largest population of immigrants coming to the U.S. illegally, per capita, more so than any other country in the world right now. But things don't, don't really make sense. You see, in 2005, Honduras signed CAFTA, the Central America Free Trade Agreement. Before that time, Honduras was considered the breadbasket of Central America exporting food throughout the region and beyond in the late 80s and early 90s. But with Honduras having this push for development like many countries around the globe, the protections on the farmer were removed. Protections uh, that guaranteed the prices of key commodities essential for the local economy. Protections that many farmers in our land still enjoy today. Protections that my family has benefited from directly. Without these protections, Tens of thousands fled the local family farm. See, this is exactly what the, the owners of the maquilas or, or the large sweatshops, this is what they were after when they were pushing this legislation to remove these protections. See, for CAFTA to be successful, there had to be production. Production of goods to ship to the U.S. And, and for there to be production, there had to be labor. And for there to be labor, there had to be a source. And that source was the family farm. Over 500,000 people have migrated from across Honduras to the industrial capital of Cortez in just the past recent years. The impact on the GDP of Honduras, the gross domestic product, the value of all the goods produced in the country, it's been phenomenal. See, if we take a snapshot of the total GDP of Honduras from five years before CAFTA and five years after CAFTA was signed, from 2000-2010, it's remarkable what we can find out. See, in 2000, total GDP sat at just under $8 billion. But by 2010, that number had risen more than doubling to $16 billion. By any student of economics measure, things are looking up for Honduras. Total imports fell right in line, growing from three to $9 billion. And total exports followed that nicely from two to $6 billion. Any economist would tell you that the massive investment made by institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the massive loans to help Honduras climb out of poverty, 
it had paid off. Honduras was generating wealth and things were changing. But if we look a little bit closer and look at the total population living at or below the poverty line during those same 10 years, it's quite remarkable what we see. See, in 2000, the total percent of Honduras living below the poverty line was 51.9%. And in those 10 years of really incredible wealth that was being generated in this little Central American country, we would expect that number to be dropping dramatically or at least staying stagnant. But it didn't. Rather, it rose a full eight percentage points by 2010, coming in at 60% of the total population living below the poverty line. Folks, something's wrong if total GDP, total imports, and total exports are increasing dramatically, and at the same time, the total numbers of people living in poverty increasing as well. So here's the problem. So life on the farm, it wasn't easy, but you had three squares a day. You didn't have the latest technology or new pair of Nikes, but your family unit was strong, and you didn't worry about your kid's safety. Now you find yourself working in a large industrial park, Pay isn't what you thought it would be, and the work is hard, the days are long. To keep up, you leave your kids at home alone, and since you struggle to make ends meet, you live in a marginal neighborhood. Pretty soon, your kids at home alone, they find a new family, and that of the gangs. And after a while, you're overworked, you're worn out, and you can't take it, and you quit. And embarrassed, you don't go back home either. So you stay. And, and that place that once seemed like this beautiful urban sprawl now feels just like urban squalor. And that gang-ridden barrio you live in leaves much to be desired. It doesn't take long before it feels like the only option available is to set off on a very dangerous journey in search of an ever-elusive American dream to the north. This situation is being played out around the globe. And while more and more free trade agreements are being signed, the world has experienced a technological enlightenment. Over the last decade, the number of folks with access to a mobile device has exploded around the world. On the continent of Africa alone, the, the growth has been exponential. Ghana, for example, from 2002 to 2015, saw a rise in mobile phone users from 8 to 83% of the population. Similar numbers are reported from across the continent of Africa, according to the Pew Research Center. In 1998, I made my first trip to Honduras, and at that time, only a few major cities had mobile phone coverage. But by 2005, the entire country was connected, and today, remarkably, it's reported that 90% of all Hondurans own a mobile device. You see, telecommunications pioneers, they, they realized that these places where at one time it had been impossible to be connected, now it's really easy to connect. It can be made affordable, yet profitable at the same time. One of those telecommunications giants, Digicel, is owned by Irish billionaire Dennis O'Brien. Digicel operates in 33 markets globally. Digicel, along with other telecommunications companies with similar strategies, they, have, they perfected their approach to the developing world. Mass marketing tied to giveaways of, of simple mobile phones that quickly hooked the inhabitants of those poverty-stricken slums as, as well as opened the eyes for the first time to that rural subsistence farmer, to just exactly what he was missing out on in the global south. Then by 2010, these same telecommunications companies, they expanded their portfolios to include affordable satellite TV. Now for about $15 a month, you can have a little simple red satellite dish stuck on the side of your mud hut in your, in your remote jungle village of Honduras, where every day you can enjoy the, the local news as well as international news but also you can enjoy the pop culture reality show phenomena that we export from our land, like Honey Boo Boo and Duck Dynasty. Folks, if what we're exporting from our land around the globe, conveniently dubbed into French and Spanish, if what we're exporting as reality consists of a trailer park beauty queen and a couple of bearded good old boys, who wouldn't want to come to be a part of this reality? <laughs> who wouldn't want to be here? Then in 2013, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced a, a new endeavor. Free Basics is the name of it. It's a partnership with technology manufacturers 
and telecommunication companies around the globe with a goal to connect the two-thirds of the world's population to the internet that was still unconnected. Today, more than 15 million people have accessed the internet for the first time through the Free Basics program. Statistics say that one in 10 that access the internet for the first time are able to climb out of poverty. But it wasn't entirely about helping the impoverished escape poverty that was motivating Zuckerberg. The white paper that he released in 2013 that detailed this new endeavor, it, it might read like an incredible gesture of humanitarian aid through access to technology, but in, in reality, it was gonna achieve some very different goals. You see, now Facebook was going to have a very captive audience to advertise to in new and emerging markets, in particular since the internet was only accessible through the Facebook app. Remarkably, it's reported that more than half of all first-time users of the internet through the Free Basics program had signed up to pay for full data on their devices within 30 days. So what might have sounded like an incredible gesture of humanitarian aid was, for all practical purposes, very wise marketing. And for an enormous reality check, a large number of the countries participating in the Free Basics Plan are located on the continent of Africa. Now a continent plagued with conflict, famine, and failed aid programs had access like never before to what life really was like in the global north. You see, so if access to a simple mobile device had left any doubt in that disenfranchised, unemployed slum dweller, if it left any doubt what they're missing out on, now access to affordable satellite TV or free internet was surely to open their eyes. Folks, what we're talking about here is a case of planetary haves and have-nots. On this planet called Earth, and in a country called the USA, our poverty line is set at about $64 a day, or about $25,000 a year. That's more money than most doctors, lawyers, and upper-level management earn in a year in the developing world. And on that same planet Earth, the World Bank sets the poverty line for the developing nations at $2 a day. From 1991 to 2005, the numbers of people living in extreme poverty around the globe were cut in half, except in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, home to many of those same countries from the Free Basics program from Facebook. Sub-Saharan Africa, home to the overwhelming majority of the economic refugees fleeing out of North Africa, risking their lives in the Mediterranean to enter Europe. Sub-Saharan Africa, who in those same 14 years, saw the number of people living in extreme poverty rise from 11 to 28 percent. Social and economic development programs are failing. Meanwhile, large multinational corporations continue to increase their profits from endeavors in many of the same countries whose poverty lines continue to rise. You know, we live in a fallen world, and we're imperfect people. We tend to our own best interests as, as individuals and as people groups. And we're apt to repeat the same mistakes when we disregard our fallen condition and ignore our history. In 1776, we made great claims of equality for all men, yet we enslaved our own until the Civil War almost 100 years later. And then after the Civil War, with an increased workforce of both African-American and white workers, they got together to fight poor conditions, poor pay, and long hours until eventually new laws were enacted. And as production was growing across the U.S., the cost of production was growing as well, and particularly because of these new labor laws. Until then, we realized we could still get cheap labor beyond our borders. We didn't realize exactly how cheap just yet, but we were going to get addicted really quick. Over the course of 150 years, we went from enslaving our own to outsourcing our slavery around the globe to developing nations. And in spite of eventual recognition that all men included both African Americans and women, we still failed to honor the very declaration that our country was founded on through willful ignorance of its application to other people groups around the globe. We failed to secure the workforce beyond our borders. 
We fail to acknowledge who we shake hands with. We've turned a blind eye to those who we do business with in order to achieve the prices we want on the products we want. While well, many American corporations continue to profit intentionally at the expense of others, the world's receiving a wake-up call to the dire need of others. You know, when we make poor choices out of corporate self-interest, there's often unintended consequences. The current rising tide of immigration in our land, it's not sustainable. The rising tide of the global south to the global north, it's not sustainable, but isolation is not the answer. Rather, it's innovation. We've tried to keep everyone out. It doesn't work because even the finest castle with the best walls will eventually fail when they're besieged by the masses. But what if we innovate the way we do business around the globe so the rest of the world will want to stay at home? What if we innovate the way we do business so the rest of the globe could thrive at home? So that the rest of the world could chase after that same life to the fullest that you and I all want at home. This innovation will require a dramatic commitment to humane wages that allow workers to not only survive, but to thrive. You see, if, if you want to protect your country, the future of your country, if you want to continue to enjoy capitalism and its benefits, then we must take steps to protect and to secure the sustainable future of the overseas workforce. The social entrepreneurial endeavors of our organization, Mission Lazarus, are proof that you can run a profitable business paying great wages and earn a profit at the same time. We're creating jobs in employment-deprived communities in both Honduras and Haiti that are also generating valuable revenue that we're able to put directly back into our development initiatives. I, I get it. Doing your weekly grocery shopping at Whole Foods, it's, it's not practical for most of us. But I believe that knowledge is power, and when we, the people, have the power, then we can change the world. The choices that you guys make today will directly affect the futures of your children and your grandchildren. But if we fail to act because, one, it's not going to be easy, Two, the shareholders drive the bottom line. And three, you know what? It's my company. I worked hard to build it. It's my money. I'm going to use it how I want to. If we fail to act in life as we know it in Western Europe and the U.S., we'll not continue. See, I believe that as savvy businessmen and women, we may be able to have the market cornered in many areas for a long time. But nobody can have monopoly on life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and have it last for forever. Thank you.